I invite you to hear God's word from the ninth chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. This is the word of the Lord. Of all the moving stories that the great preacher Fred Craddock told in his six decades of preaching ministry, none has impacted me more strongly than this one. When Fred was a young pastor just out of seminary, he served this beautiful small country church, his first call, in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Now, at the time, Oak Ridge was rapidly expanding, and many new people were moving into town as the construction industry boomed. Many of the newcomers in that town lived near the church in a series of quickly built mobile home parks, these trailers filled to overflowing with young children and large families. Fred, Fred the pastor, saw all these new people and, and thought his little church ought to reach out to them, to invite them, to welcome them. So at the next board meeting, he enthusiastically recommended a, a plan to welcome the newcomers. His plan was not well-received. Oh, I don't think so, the chair of the board replied. They, they, they wouldn't fit in. After all, they're just here temporarily. The young pastor was taken by surprise. Well, they, they may be here temporarily, but, but don't they need the gospel? Don't they need a church? The meeting that night lasted a long time, went like that, back and forth, but no decision was reached, and instead, in good church fashion, another meeting was called for the following week. At that meeting, though, the board members were well prepared, and business progressed rapidly. One member stood immediately, I move that in order to be a member of this church, your family must own property in our county. After after the pastor was reminded that he didn't have a vote, that motion passed unanimously. On the way out to the parking lot, one board member reassured Fred, saying, you know, it's really better this way. They, they just wouldn't fit in here. The wrong kind of people. Two decades later, Fred Craddock and his wife Nettie happened to be driving near Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and and they decided they would stop by the old church. It took a while for them to find it. Lots of new homes and even an interstate had been built since then. Finally, though, they found that old country road, and there, nestled in the pine trees, the beautiful white frame country church was sitting there just as always except now there was a big parking lot out front. It was filled with cars and trucks, even motorhomes and motorcycles. 
As they pulled into that big parking lot, they saw it, a big sign in front of the old church that read, Barbecue, all you can eat, chicken, ribs, pork. Fred and Nettie went inside the restaurant and found the place packed with all kinds of people, white, black, Hispanic, and Asian, rich and poor, Southerners and Northerners, and Fred turned to his wife and said, thank God this isn't a church anymore. If it were, these people would not be welcome. They wouldn't fit in. This month at Second, we're going to spend a little time rethinking church. I find sometimes that those of us within the community of faith can take its basic purpose for granted. And I know firsthand that even the word church itself tends to evoke a wide variety of different images these days, not all of them positive Is the church a a community center, a recreation league, a social club, a political organization, a religious sect? Are we here as as a sanctuary from the world, a center of action in the world, or a prophetic voice to the world? As we launch this series, it might help us to recall how the church got its start, This morning, we remember that the community of faith in Jesus Christ began with all the wrong kind of people, people who didn't fit in anywhere else. In the gospel accounts of his life, Jesus is almost never found with the religious leaders of his time unless they are gathered around to reprimand him for his low standards or lawlessness. That's precisely the kind of story we have from the Gospel of Matthew this morning. Jesus taking his seat at dinner surrounded by those who disobeyed the laws of Moses. The immoral, the amoral, the criminals and castaways, the unclean and the impure, the ones whom respectable members of religious society would never have over for dinner. Like most of Jesus' public actions, this is more than a meal, it is a metaphor designed to teach a lesson specifically arranged to upset the self-righteous, and it works. The Pharisees are incensed. The disciples are speechless. Jesus alone is composed in response. These are precisely the ones I have come to call. This has never been an easy truth for the church to accept or embody. Throughout its existence, the community formed in Jesus' name has struggled with the temptation to define and then exclude the wrong kinds of people. Paul, I think, had this very temptation squarely in mind when he wrote with conviction and candor to the Romans, you have no excuse, whoever you are, when you pass judgment on another, for in judging the others you pass, you condemn yourself. In other words, our eagerness to judge is itself a violation of God's grace. Ouch. Now, many times in the Gospels, Jesus urges those who follow him to repent, to turn away from their harmful words and actions, to live ethically, to embody God's love. Jesus does not call sinners and expect them to remain sinful, but his harshest words are reserved for those who spend all their time condemning the acts of others 
drawing as much attention as possible to the sin of someone else, all the while ignoring the sin of their own self-righteousness. I think the church today struggles with this same tendency, this same temptation, to draw lines of judgment against those on the outside. And I know that this perception of judgmentalism drives many away from communities that could be places of acceptance and healing. It is a vicious cycle. It is a vicious cycle that Jesus breaks with these unsettling words of expansive inclusion. And so perhaps the community gathered in Jesus' name is always a collection of the wrong kind of people, all accepted by God's grace. When we define the church in any other way, we we miss the point that Jesus makes so powerfully in this morning's text that church is not about our acting or looking the part. In fact, church is not about us at all. And that's good news. For often we assume that we need to have it all together in order to be part of the church. As harmful as our judgment of others can be, most of us reserve our most severe judgment for ourselves. I hear it all the time, God couldn't possibly use me. I'm the wrong kind of person. I wonder about Matthew. We know exactly how the Pharisees felt about Jesus reaching out to to tax collectors and sinners, but Matthew is quiet in this morning's text. I wonder how he felt when tapped on the shoulder by Jesus and invited into that community. I wonder if he felt like the wrong kind of person. God couldn't possibly use me. The words and actions of Jesus offer a refreshing reply to this constant barrage of self-appraisal. You are included not because you are righteous, but because God is gracious. This summer, a powerful documentary explored the life and death of Robin Williams, the comedian and actor who took his own life four years ago this summer. I remember at the time how that tragic suicide touched so many. And certainly the loss of a leading light of the entertainment industry was part of that. But, but I believe that, that his death struck a nerve because of what we know to be true of ourselves and those we love. We know how we walk through this life with painted smiles, with forced enthusiasm, while the realities of depression, loneliness, fear, and constant struggle always lie just beneath the surface. In response to Robin Williams' death, a a colleague of mine wrote a powerful piece titled, Fighting the Battle Within Together. In part, Steve writes, we have become incredibly and frighteningly skilled at masking who we are inside. We've convinced ourselves that to share that kind of pain would not be acceptable or would be too much of a burden for others to bear or would run contrary to the totally unrealistic expectation we have of ourselves and others that that we are supposed to be the ones who have it all together, who have it all figured out. We're afraid and so we keep it inside. He offers us all this practical advice. Remember everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. Be kind always. I wonder if we could rethink church 
in a way that welcomes authenticity. A beloved colleague and friend of mine likes to remind me regularly of this truth. He says, Chris, you're not okay, I'm not okay, and that's okay. (laughs) The tragic paradox of our time is that we all know that all is not well with us. And yet we close off avenues for sharing that might transform, heal, and encourage us. We hide weaknesses and broadcast perfection. It is a lie. It is exhausting. It is not how we were intended to live. Last week, I caught part of the program, This American Life, on NPR. The the topic of the episode was how I got into college. And the opening story caught my attention. It it featured a conversation with a man named Rick Clark, who is director of undergraduate admissions at Georgia Tech. Clark describes with a great deal of humor some of the misguided admissions efforts that he has experienced. What struck me as most representative of our culture were his descriptions of parents calling admissions staff and pretending to be their own children, (laughs) literally impersonating the cadence and voice and word usage of an 18-year-old. What has come of us? What God desires is not perfection, is not harsh self-appraisal, and certainly not judgment of everybody else. I find that this is a refreshing word for a culture of achievement, in which we are defined by, by accomplishment, in which we seek to distinguish ourselves. Our worth is determined by the titles we hold or the salaries we earn, the grades we make, the schools we attend, the cars we drive, the clubs we join, the accolades we accumulate, and brothers and sisters, even the church can become a symbol of status in such a culture. Don't our souls crave a sense of belonging that is not earned? Don't we long for a place where we are gathered not by our unique accomplishments, but by our common experience of the need for grace? I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Not those who have it all figured out, but anyone who needs this gift of grace. God desires mercy. God extends mercy. I know that some of you grew up embraced in the loving arms of the church, but I also know that some of you were turned away. That some of you are trying out faith for the first time or coming back after a long time. Some of you are surrounded by your closest friends in this place, but some of you are still wondering if there is a place for you, if God can ever accept you. Some need a fresh start, a radical welcome, a place to encounter God, a community of authenticity. Some of you are here to recommit your life, and some are just about to give it up. Whatever you think of yourself, whatever you believe about the church, at least consider this. Today you are welcomed not because of who you are, but because of who God is. Here, Jesus Christ welcomes all the wrong kinds of people, people like me and you, and the person next to you, and even the person who most annoys you. Hear your beautiful, broken self can rest in God's grace. And by that grace, find in this unlikely collection of people 
something different. Not the wrong people, but chosen, changed people. Your name is on the invitation. An empty place awaits you at the table. Come just as you are. Amen.